Our scripture is also a different scripture today. It's from Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. Would please stand for that reading? As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? Why, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what they had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, we have had a morning, haven't we? The leadership in this church is amazing, Robert. Thank you. That, that was wonderful. We could probably just end now because that was a, a wonderful message you gave us. Diane, great leadership on the stewardship. Uh, you're, you've amazed me with your approach to this, and I thank you for your leadership. Sharon, thank you. Um, and, of course, all of our musicians. We're so blessed. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fill us. We long to hear from you, Lord. We long to feel you, to touch you, to see you in our everyday lives. And so speak to our hearts right now, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, do we have any classical music fans here? How many of you have heard of Joshua Bell? Anybody? No? You're kidding. Joshua Bell is a world-renowned, highly acclaimed violinist. Um, he has played with all over the world with the world's best orchestras, mastering the sounds of Beethoven and Brahms and Bach, uh, just to name a few. Well, in 2007, in collaboration with the Washington Post, Joshua Bell helped with an interesting social experiment. He stationed himself at a post at a busy Washington, D.C. subway uh, station entrance, donning a baseball cap and some casual clothes as a little slight disguise. And a hidden camera recorded Bell as he played his classical violin for 45 minutes, not holding back on his talent. He played as if you know, he were in a great symphony hall. Of the 1,097 people who passed by him, only seven people stopped to listen to this man who is arguably the best violinist in the entire world. Seven people out of 1,097 people. Only one person out of those 1,097 people recognized him for who he was. Quite amazing. So what does that social experiment tell us about people? Well, for one thing, it tells us that as a society, we are so busy and so focused on our own to-do list, on where we need to be next, on the million things that are on our minds and, sadly, on the screens that are in front of our faces, that we often fail to see the miracles that are right in front of us. We are too busy to appreciate one another, let alone to see the extraordinary in our lives. Let's face it. We are so often blinded by the busyness 
and the challenges of our lives that we don't recognize Jesus even though he is walking right beside of us the entire journey. It is a common trait of our human condition. So we read a little bit of the passage from Luke that is the story of the walk to Emmaus. But I'd like to read the whole story for you now. So it goes like this. It starts, if you want to read with us, you can. It's Luke 24, starting at verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, does Jesus ask them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And then it goes on, um, the part that, that Sharon has already read for us, where he walks along with them, and then they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. So in this passage, we have two disciples of Jesus who are on a journey, both literal and spiritual, They're walking from Jerusalem to their own village of Emmaus. Tells us it's a seven-mile journey. And by the way, Luke is the only uh, book that tells this amazing story. So who are these two travelers? Only one of them is identified by name, Cleopas. But he is mentioned nowhere else in the New Testament. And so we don't really know exactly who he is, and we don't know the name of his companion. But we do know from the text that these two are part of the larger group of followers, and they know the original 11 disciples as well. And they know what has happened in Jerusalem during the past week. The scripture tells us that they are walking along and talking with each other about all these things that have happened. So I imagine them recounting the great acts that they've witnessed, the great things that Jesus has done. I imagine them recounting his righteous teaching of the scriptures. They probably recalled his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And then, of course, the surprising arrest and the unthinkable torture and the crucifixion of Jesus. We know that it's not a very pleasant conversation. It is the sharing of disbelief and tremendous grief and sorrow. 
These two have lost someone that they love dearly. The man they believe to be the Messiah, the Savior of all the world, the man who would redeem Israel, has been killed. They've lost hope. But we could infer from the part that I just read that they didn't lose all hope when Jesus was crucified. It is only when they doubted that he had risen that they actually lose all hope. Since it is so late on the day, um, on the third day since Christ's death, and they know that the women came back with the news that the body was gone, We know that they've stayed in Jerusalem long enough until the evening, hoping to see Jesus alive. It's the third day. They recalled the prophecy of the scriptures and Jesus' own words about coming back. So they waited until the day was almost over, hoping that they would see Jesus. Then, seeing no proof with their own eyes, they give up. And they're headed home to Emmaus, defeated and hopeless. The two are beaten down. They have lost hope because they thought the man they knew as Jesus was the Messiah who would redeem them. Perhaps they gave up everything to follow Jesus and his teachings. And then they end up here on this long, lonely, seven-mile journey with no sign of Jesus and complete confusion as to where their spiritual lives go from here. Then in verse 7, we read that Jesus himself came near and went with them. But somehow they are prevented from recognizing him. We don't know exactly what this means, but it, it almost seems like Jesus intentionally kept them from recognizing him. Do you find yourself wanting to yell at them? Like, wake up, look, Jesus is standing right beside you. He's talking to you. Don't you see him? Hello. But we can't do that. I'm sure you see the significance of this story for you and me. Because you and I are a lot like these disciples, aren't we? We want to see real evidence of God. We fail to see God, though, when he's right beside us. Why can't God just show up in person and give us some some proof, something real that we can say is certain, that we can hold on to? Why can't he just reveal himself to us like he did back in the Old Testament? Why can't he part the waters for us? Why doesn't he do something miraculous in our lives? We want some proof that Jesus is here, that he is alive. Just like the early disciples, when we fail to see the proof of our faith in the ways that we expect, we give up. We can't see God in the picture of our lives. Too often, what we're doing is we're We're seeing our difficulties. We're seeing our challenges and our sorrows and our struggles. Maybe we still have faith, but we aren't living each day as if God is with us. We're not living with excitement and anticipation, knowing that we belong to God, that Christ himself dwells in us, that God is right here beside us. We find it hard to live each day with our hearts burning inside us. Wouldn't it be great if we could just get a little divine intervention now and then? A little God sighting around town to help us believe? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could recognize Jesus in our ordinary, everyday lives? Let me share a little personal story with you. Years ago, I was uh, struggling with sorrow and depression. It's the kind of depression that makes you feel like you've got a wet blanket over you. 
you just, you can't climb out of it. It was a dark um, time in my life. And I had a lot of emotional and physical pain. So one morning I had decided to get a massage, hoping it would make me feel better. And I looked up some place to go. I had never been to this place, but it, I don't remember if I looked on the internet or what it was, but I found this place close to my home and I decided I would go there to get a massage. So I went, and um, if you've ever gotten a massage, you know that when you go into the room, it's usually very dimly lit, candles, and maybe some soft music. You know, it's a very relaxing kind of thing, but it's, it's usually pretty dark. Um, so I went in and prepared for that, and um, the lady that was gonna give me the massage uh, seemed to be very caring and sweet and um, so she gave me the massage and she talked a little bit. They usually don't talk a lot during massage because it's supposed to be relaxing. But I could tell that she was a Christian and you know she asked about me and I shared just a little bit, not much. Um, but she knew that I was struggling. And so at the end of the massage, uh, she washed my feet. She washed my feet, just like Jesus did for the disciples. And then the really amazing thing was when she was done and she left the room and I opened my eyes and sat up uh, to get dressed, I looked around the room. I hadn't seen any of this when I came in because I was so depressed and because the room was dimly lit, but mainly because I was depressed. I looked around and there were crosses all over the room. I had not seen a one of them when I walked in. Jesus was there. I just didn't see him. And Jesus is there for you too. Maybe there have been times in your life that you've struggled to see God or you've doubted his love, or your faith has been worn thin by the weight of everyday life. It's okay to feel doubt. It's normal for us to have times when our faith is threadbare. It's common for us to experience dry times in our spiritual lives when we can't seem to find God. And it happens when we're overwhelmed by circumstances and we feel that God is not there. Perhaps we can't see God when our children or our grandchildren are struggling, and despite our constant prayer, things don't seem to be getting better. Or when we've left the doctor's office with a life-changing diagnosis that we didn't expect. Or when our marriage is hanging by a thread and we don't know how to redeem it. Maybe we lose sight of Jesus when we're lonely or longing for days past. We lose sight of Jesus for many reasons, but it is always us who loses sight of Jesus. He never, ever loses sight of us. These two disciples knew Jesus personally. They witnessed his mighty deeds. They personally heard him proclaim what would happen and yet they still doubted. Jesus told them that he would be handed over, that he would be killed, and that he would rise again on the third day. But after all the proof that he gave them of who he was, they still doubted. And they still did not know how to live a life of faith without Jesus being physically present with them. 2,000 years later, here we are, as human as the first disciples. And we do have the same struggles. Of course, of course we do. If they doubted and struggled, even as eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, then we are certainly going to have doubts and fears too. And that's okay. That is part of our human condition. The story of the walk to Emmaus is a great reminder of who we are in this post-resurrection era, 
how we come to recognize Christ in our everyday lives. In verse 27, it says, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Can you imagine that? Jesus is giving them a Bible study lesson right there. Wouldn't that have been fantastic to be in that class? And then in verse 32, they talk about how their hearts were burning when he was teaching them. Friends, Christ is made known to us in the reading of scriptures. He is made known to you every time you open this Bible. We experience the presence of Christ in the receiving of Holy Communion. Every month that we come up here to the table, we come and we experience, we encounter the living Christ through the sacraments. Just as important as connecting with Jesus in worship, though, is connecting with the resurrected Christ in your everyday life. Do you have your eyes open, ready to see Jesus? Are you expecting to see him today? Jesus Christ is alive. Say that with me. Jesus Christ is alive. He is alive. We must have the faith and we must open our eyes to see him all day long. He's found in the eyes of those we love. You ever see that? You look into someone's eyes that you love and you see this thing, it's Jesus. He's there in our songs of praise. He whispers to us in the breezes. He speaks to us through the beauty of every sunrise and every sunset. Jesus is all around us every moment. Perhaps you're in that darkness of winter or your faith has been threadbare from the circumstances in your life. Let me encourage you to open your eyes to see Jesus. Look for him in the laughter of children, in the sharing of a meal, in the hug of a friend, in the serving of your neighbor. Look for Jesus in the rising of the sun and in the breezes brushing against your face. Open your eyes and see Jesus in the struggle of those that you know and in the heart of those who mourn. I assure you, he is there. Take heart in these words from Matthew 28, 30. Jesus says, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And for that, we give you thanks and praise, almighty God now and forever. Amen.